this next session, you'll see Stefan Roman being interviewed by Peter Harrigan. If you enjoy the session, take a selfie and share your digital festival experience on our Facebook, Twitter or Instagram accounts to encourage your friends to join in too. So now, please give a virtual welcome to Stefan Roman. Stephen Roman, author of Island Empires, Romanov, Russia, Britain and the Isle of Wight. Welcome to the 2021 Isle of Wight Literary Digital Festival. Thank you very and, much. Uh, your book was published this summer, and I know that you've already had a round of very successful launch events here on the Isle of Wight, which included two um, COVID secure events at East Cow's Town Hall, mm -hmm. a grand Imperial Russian tea party in congressly set in Vedna at yeah. the Royal Hotel. So first, Stephen, if you could give us a little background on your own education and your fascination with history and also a distinguished career in cultural diplomacy. Tell us a little about your own life. Oh, thank you very much, uh, Peter, for that introduction. Um, yes, I, I mean, I've uh, long interests, obviously, in history. Um, I, I studied um, history at the University of Oxford. Um, I've written a, a number of books with historical themes. Um, before the Romanov book, I did one on Islamic manuscripts, which was uh, published a few years ago. Um, but my particular background experience, as you said, has also been in international cultural diplomacy. I worked for the British Council um, for many years um, in Europe, in the Middle East, in North America and East Asia. And it, it, during that time, I did spend time in Russia. Um, at that time, the British Council had a considerable network of offices around Russia, and um, I was able to uh, visit there, particularly in relation to our library work. Um, I ran the British Council's libraries and archives and, and uh, information department um, for, for many years, several years, about 10 years in the 90s. So, uh, but history has never been far from my interests, obviously, and uh, once I left the British Council, I decided to return um, to researching and writing about history, and the Romanovs has always been very high up on my um, list because of my family background. Thanks, Stephen. And, and can you pinpoint actually a time and moment when you said to yourself, I'm going to sit down and write a book about the Isle of Wight and Russian links? Yeah, that's a very interesting question because I think it's a combination of a, you know, a number of factors. Obviously, the Romanovs have always interested me, as I've said. Um, my, my own grandparents fled Russia um, during the Bolshevik Revolution. So I was brought up in a way with a lot of stories about Russia and about Tsarist Russia, the last days of Tsarist Russia, and about my family's flight from Russia. So I had it in the back of my mind maybe to do something um, about the family, about the family history and about the, uh, how, they, how they came eventually to arrive in, 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 first of all, through Lithuania to Poland and then to Britain. Um, but then I, then I thought probably there wasn't actually enough material there because, of course, the memories have gone from the family. You know, my grandparents had died and there weren't many sort of archives or papers left from the family side. So I thought I need to set this in a wider context of the fall of Russia, Imperial Russia. Um, that then led me to start thinking a little bit about, you know, why did Russia collapse? Why did Tsarist Russia collapse? And, and, you know, intriguingly, of course, the links with Britain were very important, you know, the relationship between the two countries. And in a way, those are the two parts of my background. So I thought, well, why don't I write a book which brings those two elements together? You know, my British side, my British family side and my Russian family side, and try and understand a bit about Anglo-Russian relations and how my families came together in a way, um, you know, to be in Britain. Um, so that was the kind of genesis. I thought, well, what angle shall I take? And I've always been, as you know, interested in, in, in international relations. And so exploring Anglo-Russian relations um, seemed an appropriate way to look at it. The Isle of Wight, that's interesting because I've obviously made a lot of visits to the Isle of Wight. And I began to sort of realise there were a lot of Romanov links to the Isle of Wight. And I suppose one of the sort of trigger factors may have been the unveiling of the Romanov Cross um, in, in July 19, uh, 2018 in East Cowes which sort of in a way seemed to cement the links between the Isle of Wight and the Romanovs. And I thought, no, here's a, here's a book that could be written through the lens of the Isle of Wight in a way to give a little bit of more sort of immediacy and humanity um, to the story of the relationship. I mean, Anglo-Russian relations is a big, huge topic. 
how do you in a way make it more um, accessible to people? How do you make it more understandable? And the Isle of Wight stories, as I began to research them, were intriguing enough and interesting enough that I thought, yes, I can weave these in and sort of link the Isle of Wight stories um, to the bigger Anglo-Russian relationship. And of course, you know, the final visit by the Tsar in, uh, to the Isle of Wight in 1909 was, in my opinion, and still is in my opinion, probably the, the, the high point of Anglo-Russian relations. So in a way, you started off knowing that there were strong links with the imperial family, which threaded into the Isle of Wight. You probably already knew about Hoy, Michael Hoy, and the monument that stands in, in the south of the island. Mm. What about all the other stuff that was waiting to be uncovered? I mean, did you have already have a sort of cache of notes and research documents? Well, I always knew about the 1909 visit. I mean, I think that was the major... Um, in, a, in a sense, a link, uh, you know, that most important political link um, w w in which the Isle of Wight was involved. I, I actually didn't know about Michael Hoy and about the Hoy Monument. Um, that's something that I came across as I did my research. Um, and I also didn't really know a lot about the um, Russian radicals in Ventnor. So that was another very surprising. I mean, I knew that I knew that Karl Marx, although he's not Russian, had been there, and I knew that Hertz and Alexander Hertz and the agrarian socialists had been there, but I didn't know about the whole wider Russian radical community in Ventnor. So that became an important part of the book, <clears throat> in a sense, not only just exploring about the Romanovs on the Isle of Wight, but about their opponents as well on the Isle of Wight. Um, then there were many other stories I didn't realise about Grand, know so much about Grand Duchess Maria Alexandrovna, the daughter of Alexander II, and the fact she had spent such a large period on the Isle of Wight. And the numerous visits by various Romanov Grand Dukes to the Isle of Wight and the links with the Royal Yacht Squadron. So there was a lot of a lot of information I had I uncovered as I began to explore all this. So yes, I had in mind originally a book about the um, 1909 visit. That was mainly what it was going to centre around. But as I uh, began to sort of research and read up, I realised there were a lot of other very interesting stories. And of course, as you say, it's it's a big book, 420 pages. But of course, it's not just about the Isle of Wight. I mean, there's a lot in there about Anglo-Russian relations more broadly. Um, and I talk about the Crimean War. I talk about the Napoleonic Wars. I talk about Peter the Great. Uh, and, and that that was actually a very interesting story I uncovered too, the links with Peter the Great and the Isle of Wight, which I hadn't expected. And the fact that an Isle of Wight shipbuilder uh, was responsible for building uh, Peter the Great's first Baltic fleet. Um, so yes, the, 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 the Romanovs are intimately connected with the island, and the island is intimately connected with the wider Anglo-Russian relationship. Can you share with us some of the, the background, your family connections, and, and how they inspired you to move forward with this work? Yes. Um, well, as I mentioned earlier, my grandparents fled Bolshevik Russia in about 1920. Um, my grandfather was Emil Konradovich Romanovsky. Um, he was a very senior official in the Tsarist Imperial Administration, uh, based in latterly in Moscow, that the family originally from near St. Petersburg, his family was near St. Petersburg. And he was in charge of an um, important part of, or section of um, Imperial Posts and Telegraphs for the, I think it was the East Moscow district before the revolution. So they were very well placed. My grandmother was a well-known, reasonably well-known photographer um, uh, before the revolution. She's one of the first women to train as a photographer. She originally came from um, Lithuania, from which was then under Russian rule, was part of the Russian empire. And she trained as a photographer in St. Petersburg and she traveled widely across the empire before the revolution, I think. Sometimes I look at, she lost her entire archive of photographs, of course, when they fled. Sometimes I look at books which show pictures of pre-revolutionary Russia. I wonder if some of those might be her photographs. Anyway, they had a, a very traumatic two-year um, period escaping Moscow, getting, and they eventually uh, headed towards uh, Crimea. They couldn't escape from the Crimea. That, that fell to the, to the Red Army. Uh, they had then to escape, uh, cross into Romania. And they had a very near death experience, I would say, by, you know, they were nearly caught and shot, uh, but managed to be taken by a Romanian fisherman across the river and, and to safety in Romania. And that's all described in the opening chapters of the book. Because, you know, one of the things people often concentrate on when they talk about the Romanovs, people get very focused on, of course, the fate of the dynasty 
and the dreadful end of the Tsar and his family, um, and maybe some of the ar top aristocratic families. But you have to remember uh, that there were millions of people displaced as a result of the revolution. Um, and many of them uh, either died in the civil wars that followed or fled into exile. It was like the collapse of an entire society, like the sinking of Atlantis, uh, you know, this the revolution took down with it, not just the top elites, but all the sort of people who had supported the regime, uh, the Romanov regime. So this was a, a tra you know, it's an unparalleled tragedy in a sense of an entire country uh, collapsing from within. Um, and so in a way, the book is also a tribute to all those people who had, you know, invested so much of their time and lives in supporting the Romanov regime and found themselves suddenly cast adrift, uh, like my grandparents, who had to really begin a new life completely from scratch again. You know, my grandfather was 15 when he fled Russia and he'd had a whole prosperous life there before the, before the revolution, believed that he would always be living in Russia and so would his descendants. And suddenly he was adrift in, in, a, in a foreign land. And so that whole experience kind of inspired me to say, I wanted to understand more about what had happened um, on the Russian side. And then obviously, look, linking to my, my, my um, mother's family, you know, looking at it from the British perspective as well. Let's wind the clock back into those early relationships with the Isle of Wight and, and Russia. And you mentioned a role of um, the island in building up the naval power of mm. Russia, which seems to go back to a ship builder in cows i'm not sure if it was um which side of the medina he lived on east cows or cows so tell us a little about that because it's quite an extraordinary aspect of, of the island's role if if we could say that it helped build an imperial russian navy mm. yeah yes yeah, so it's a very intriguing story actually i mean the um the man you're talking about <clears throat> was joseph nye um, he wasn't originally from the Isle of Wight, but he settled in, it, it was East Cows, uh, where they had what's called Nye's Yard, um, which, you know, he ran very successfully in the late 17th century, building ships for the Royal Navy, for the English Navy. Um, Peter the Great, when he came over to England on his, he was invited by William III to come over, um, spent a lot of time, as we know, in Deptford. But on one of his visits, um, learning about shipbuilding, but one of his visits he was he made to Portsmouth and he was sailing in the Solent off the Isle of Wight. And he saw this magnificent uh, fleet, English fleet at, at anchor in, 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 off the Isle of Wight. And this inspired him obviously to think, I need a fleet on, of that scale and size. Now Nye was quick enough to realize or hear that, that Peter uh, wanted help. And he made his way to London to meet Peter the Great. And he offered his services and he said, I'm an Isle of Wight shipbuilder. I've built many of those ships that you saw at anchor. I'm very willing to come to, to Russia and help build you a new fleet. Peter took up his offer immediately. Uh, the two became the best of friends. And many of the shipbuilders recruited by Nye were obviously from Cows, from these Cows who came over. And they did build together the first uh, Russian Baltic fleet which eventually swept the Swedes from the supremacy, destroyed the supremacy of the Swedes in the Baltic. Um, and really that meant that Russia could enter into the Baltic as a European power for the first time. So in a way, Nye indirectly, or directly actually, helped create Russia as a major European naval power, which then enabled Russia, of course, to become a military power in Europe as well. Nye himself was, um, the British parliament passed an act uh, saying that no shipbuilders from the Isle of Wight could go for go to Russia anymore. They were so concerned about the size of the Russian fleet. It's the first time we get a, a real concern from Britain about Russia coming out. It was in 1721 after the defeat of the Swedes in the Baltic. And But Nye refused to go, to return. And he was made a nobleman by Peter the Great. Um, and he carried Peter the Great's coffin when after the Tsar died. He was one of the pallbearers. So you, there you have a wonderful story of how a, an Isle of Wight shipbuilder helped, cre helped create Russia as a, as a major naval power. In 2015, I was visiting the um, Isle of Wight and saw at anchor uh, a replica of the first ship that Nye had helped build, the, uh, the Standard, which was Peter the Great's first frigate of the line. And it's now a Russian, it's a replica, there's now a Russian naval uh, training ship, but it made one of its first visits to Cowes. I think, in tribute to Nye. 
obviously. So he, in fact, became a, an island expat based in St. Petersburg. There's, yeah, there's quite a lot. Uh, well, not a lot, but there is quite a lot. There's a lot of correspondence, interesting correspondence between him and the Tsar, um, some of which is in the Russian state, Imperial Ar state archives now. Um, in which, um, obviously, the two, it's easy to see the sort of very close relationship that the two of them had. Um, they became really great friends, not only just over shipbuilding, but socially as well. Um, I think they used to have many sort of rather drunken parties at night together and end up, both of them, lying sort of paralytic from drink on the carpet floor together, singing Russian songs and maybe the odd Isle of Wight shanty. Who knows? <laughs> And what about Michael Hoy? Here's another man who, who had roots um, on the island and um, uh, close, very close connections, trading connections with, with, with Russia, so an, an island opportunist. I mean, he, he's again another very intriguing um, island character with links to the Tsars. Uh, as you say, he worked for the Russia company, you know, the, the, the original British company, tra English trading company being set up to trade. Uh, with Russia back in the 17th century, which still survived and was survived up to the revolution. And Hoy was one of its leading figures in St. Petersburg. Um, he became a great admirer of the Tsar, of Tsar Alexander I. Um, and uh, when, he, when he came back he, to England, he built himself, he decided to buy land on the Isle of Wight and he built himself a house, the Hermitage. Uh, obviously in honour of the Hermitage in St. Petersburg. Um, parts of it, I think, are still standing, surviving. I St. Catherine's down. Uh, and then when Alexander I came to Britain to, on, a, on a visit to Britain after the first phase of the Napoleonic Wars in 1814, um, sort of decided to build this monument to him, uh, an extraordinary tribute to a Russian Tsar. It's the only, the first monument ever erected anywhere in Europe to a Russian Tsar, and it was built on the Isle of Wight, uh, on St. Catherine's Down. It still stands today, uh, and you can go and visit it. Uh, it's a very impressive monument, um, and on it he inscribed, you know, these sort of adulatory words to the Tsar, you know, in honour of, of Alexander I and the, the great saviour of Europe and all this kind of thing. Now, we don't know whether Alexander was on his way to see Hoy. There are some rumours that Alexander I intended to cross to the Isle of Wight. He got as far as Portsmouth. He wasn't a very good sailor. The sea was quite rough. Uh, he sort of reviewed the, not, he didn't review the fleet. He went and visited a few ships uh, in, in harbour at Portsmouth. He didn't make the crossing to the Isle of Wight. Although, as I say, some reports say he did secretly. I found no evidence for that, that he actually did make it to the Isle of Wight. But whatever, Michael remained, Michael Hoy remained his greatest admirer in Britain. Um, and the monument is there to this day um, to attest to that. It, it's, a, it's a strange relationship the two of them had. And one doesn't quite know, uh, you know, how far they were, how far had they met each other, how far they knew each other uh, very well. Certainly from Michael Hoy's, there's a little bit of hero worship there, I think, about Tsar Alexander I. But it's an interesting monument. It's a bit of a climb up St. Catherine's Down, but well worth seeing if you get up to the top there. Fascinating. And I know there's a very evocative picture with a nice skyscape of that monument in the book. Yes, um, yes. <laughs> the, um, the place very well. Um, well, we're in the South White, so we might as well go over the hill and down to what is often known as Ventnor Weird. Tell us about what was going on in Ventnor well before the great visit of the Romanovs in 1909 to Gauss. Mm. Well, you're, you're quite right that Ventnor um, had or has this radical reputation. Um, and certainly in the 19th century, it was the place where radicals from across Europe and Britain to some degree would go. Um, it wasn't just Russians who went to Ventnor. There were, there were Austrian radicals, Hungarian radicals, Italians, Germans, uh, and so on. Plus, many of the early Chartists found their way um, to Ventnor. So, you know, this town quickly established a reputation, not only for being a very healthy seaside resort, because, of course, as we know, the Queen Victoria's physician, Dr. James Clark, had written a book which recommended Ventnor as a centre for um, healing of respiratory diseases and, and so forth. Um, but also it, because it was tucked away and slightly, well, quite inaccessible, actually, till the railways came. Um, you had to only get there by occasional boat 
or stagecoach and ride, which took quite a while. So I think people felt, radicals felt rather safe there, tucked away. Um, it started actually with the Hungarian radicals who opposed the Habsburgs, uh, Leos Kossuth, uh, who'd led the uprising against the Habsburgs. He was one of the first to go there. And of course, there were, he knew um, Alexander Herzen very well, who was the leading Russian radical living in Britain, ex in exile in Britain. Uh, Herzen was an agrarian socialist. Uh, he was very opposed to the Romanovs. And uh, he'd originally lived in, in Switzerland, France, and he came to London um, in the 1850s. Um, now, uh, Leos Kossuth invited him down to come to, to Ventnor for a summer. He and his um, companion, Malvida von Meissenberg, an early German feminist, they both fell in love with, Vent with Ventnor. And they established themselves in St. Augustine's Villa um, on the seafront, um, ironically, a place which Albert and Victoria had thought about buying a few years earlier. And they made this a center of Russian radicalism. Around them, they gathered a circle of, of, of Russian radicals of different sorts who came. Uh, and Enkov and, um, and others arrived there. Um, and uh, eventually, uh, many other Russians who weren't as radical as them began to flow into Ventnor. All the people who ended up there, there was Count A.K. Tolstoy, one of Russia's greatest writers, the cousin of Leo Tolstoy. There was Ivan Turgenev, uh, the novelist, who began his novel Fathers and Sons, and in a way which spawned the whole nihilist movement, the Russian terrorist uh, political movement. Uh, that, that all began in Ventnor. So suddenly, by about 1860, 61, Ventnor was a Russian, virtually like a Russian colony. There were so many Russians there in Ventnor um, that you apparently, <clears throat> when Tom Stoppard wrote his 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 play uh, about uh, the Russian radicals. He had a, a several a scene set in Ventnor on the seafront, um, and when everybody in the background is walking around speaking Russian, um, and it's reported that Turgenev um, drafted an, a note to the Tsar. I think must be a spoof note recommending that Ventnor be annexed permanently by the Russian Empire because it had become such a centre of Russian thought and ideas. It's not reported the Tsar took any uh, <laughs> any notice of that. As to whether um, the, they felt it was a thorn in their side, um, undoubtedly Herzen was worried that C Russian C Tsarist agents were beginning to operate in Ventnor. And he was very suspicious of many of the Russians who latterly came to Ventnor. Um, he didn't trust some of them. He thought they were possibly uh, Tsarist secret agents. Uh, so there was a suspicion that there were Russians there, Tsarist police, watching other Russians. Uh, and that really drove Herzen away from Vietnam in the end. He, he decided to holiday in Bournemouth thereafter. And East Cowes and Osborne was, for much of the year, the centre of the global imperial power itself, um, with Queen Victoria mm. and the royal court and politicians beating their way to Osborne mm. for much of the summer months. Um, I mean, to what extent did, did, did the goings on in Ventnor um, raise eyebrows with the establishment and the power centre in East Cows, or was it sort of tucked away so quietly that no one really bothered? You talked about um, agents um, uh, wandering around trying to uncover these proto-Bolsheviks how did it sit with our own authorities? British authorities were remarkably relaxed about um, foreign radicals and dissidents. Um, they did not really worry too much about them. This is one of the issues, I mean, that, that, that one of the tensions that arose between uh, the Russian, the Tsarist authorities, uh, Imperial Russia and Britain. The Russians could not understand why the British were allowing these people to operate. In, on British territory, you know, and they, they, they felt that Britain and Russia were potentially allies or uh, linked through family relationships or that, you know, how come Britain, how could Britain be allowing these Russian dissidents and radicals to be you know, living so freely there and so forth? There's very little evidence, there's no evidence at all that the British security establishment, which really in a way didn't properly get going anyway till the 20th century. So by that time, the Ventnor radicals were history. Um, that the Russia, that the British security establishment worried very much about Ventnor. Um, they, they, the, the Queen Victoria certainly 
um, didn't entirely approve of the place. I mean, you know, uh, it was known for its radical associations. And um, when um, the uh, red, what we call the sort of red empress, the um, uh, Sissy, the wife of Franz Josef, the Emperor Franz Josef, came to uh, Isle of Wight in 1873, she was known for her, um, her alternative political views and her friendship with the Hungarian radicals and so forth. She did not stay in Osborne. She made her way to Bentner and she rented Steep Hill Castle. And that was clearly a, a kind of a snub. To Victoria, that she didn't in any way want to be associated with that establishment in 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 Cowes. Um, so everybody knew that in a way um, Ventnor had that tradition, um, but there's no evidence that the British authorities worried about it. It was only in the 20th century, early 20th century, that the British uh, authorities began to worry about Russian terrorists and 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 anarchists and other because of a series of, of outrages, uh, terrorist outrages in London in the early part of the 20th century, just before the Tsar's visit. Then, then they began to turn their attention to uh, what was going on, and they had a lot of security on the Isle of Wight during the 1909 visit. But before then, no, I think there was very little um, worry about them. It was there, it was known to be radical, but because they were largely foreigners, <laughs> it, it didn't worry the British too much. Uh, which is always something that's perplexed a lot of European uh, authoritarian regimes. You know, how can Britain allow these people to operate like this uh, under their noses? But I think the British always took a view of it. They're not involving us. In that case, let them get on with whatever they want to do. It's only when they start to become problems for Britain that the security here starts to take an interest. We could say that you are from a former imperial connected family. And your own views may themselves have been upended by uncovering these aspects of the proto-Bolsheviks in Venner. Um, to, to what extent did, did this surprise you and put you in a slightly awkward position writing the book? Well, I've never, I mean, I, I have a, I'm a historian first and foremost. <clears throat> I mean, obviously I have family history, personal family history linked to Imperial Russia, but I've always felt, you know, I've always understood that in a way, as a historian, you have to take a, a, an even-handed view of things. Um, my, my personal sympathies may lie, you know, with the Tsar and his family and so forth, particularly the last Tsar, you know, though I don't have any particular sympathy with his, what happened politically in Russia, I think that the, <clears throat> in a way it was a um, uh, inept handling of the, of the political situation in Russia in the early 20th century, which was one of the factors that led to the revolution. Um, so I don't, I don't in any sense defend the imperial regime. Um, it, it's a fact of history. It was there. It happened. Um, I think it's rather intriguing, actually. When I began to uncover the Bentner story, I thought this added an interesting alternative dimension. After all, you know, Russia would not have collapsed had it not been for, for the thinking and ideas of radicals and revolutionaries who many of them based in Britain, as we know, Lenin, who himself spent time in London. And you, you refer to the Bolsheviks. I mean, the Bolsheviks came as a political movement in, you know, after the split between the Mensheviks and the Bolsheviks in London in, in, in early 20th century. Um, so uh, Britain contributed a lot to creating that um, alternative Russia. And Vendor played its part. And I think that's a delicious, interesting dimension to the Isle of Wight story. You know, it could have just been a sort of uh, one dimensional imperial story with the Isle of Wight. But in fact, by having the Ventnor link and the Ventnor radicals, it actually gave it a rounded story, which linked it more centrally into the whole Anglo Russian relationship. Because the Anglo Russian relationship, more broadly, was not just about the Tsar and his family and uh, the Tsars and their families and, and Britain. It was also about the radicals, many of whom found um, refuge in Britain and were able to pursue their ideas and thinking in such a way they were able to lay the groundwork for the Russian Revolution from Britain. This is a good point to take us to that extraordinary visit of 1909, hmm. which you've written was the high point of yes. Anglo-Russian relations. Um, and I think at that time, a kind of a whole craze of all things Russia swept the country. Mm. But try to put in context that visit and what it meant to the island. And yes, um, I mean, it was an extraordinary visit in all ways. It wasn't just 
um, a, a, a visit or a meeting between two royal families at, at, the, at the cows and during cows week. And it was that obviously, and it had all those social dimensions. But when I looked at the whole history of Anglo-Russian relations, I realized the central importance of that visit was far more than just a social gathering. Um, it was a, a hugely significant political visit. Um, it was set within the context of a Europe that was on the edge, obviously, of, of the First World War. So it sealed or helped seal the new alliance um, between Britain, France and Russia, which is which is very significant. Um, it also helped set the seal on the relations between Britain and Russia, between the two empires in Central Asia. Um, so in a way, when I set about writing about the cow's visit, which, you know, occupies um, quite a section of the book, um, it's a large section at the end, I did it because I wanted to set it within its important political and social and economic context, um, not just as a, as a visit on its own, you know, with, with, the, with the social things that were happening there. So in the background to this, in a way, is, you know, Anglo-Russian relations were very poor through the most of the 19th century, despite the close family links increasingly from the middle of the 19th century, the political relationship, the imperial relationships were, 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 were very bad. Um, and of course, we know in the 1850s, the two countries went to war uh, over the Crimea. Um, actually, that's the only time that Britain and Russia had a, a direct land war with their forces engaged. It's interesting this because we've had many land wars with France or with Germany or with Spain. We only ever actually had one direct one with Russia. Generally, the Russians have been our allies uh, in the Napoleonic Wars, uh, First World War, of course, again, and then latterly in the Second World War. But the degree of suspicion that exists between the two countries uh, is interesting, given that we've generally been fighting on the same side uh, in, in, in global affairs. So this was actually a very significant move. In 1907, there was a, a, an Anglo-Russian convention signed, the first sort of treaty in the way that Russia and Britain had signed to bring stability to India, Tibet, Persia, uh, Afghanistan. Um, and that set the seal of a new friendship between the two countries. And I actually, this was the initiative of Edward VII. He's rightly called the peacemaker. He had signed the um, Entente Cordiale with France. He helped with that. He helped a great deal to get the uh, Anglo-Russian Convention through against a lot of opposition in Britain uh, to a treaty with Russia. Similarly, Nicholas II, I think, took the lead. He, he was a brave man in that regard and insisted that there should be set aside old rivalries and differences and come to some agreement with Britain. So those two men, the, the emperor and the king, um, they were responsible in many ways for driving this through. Uh, therefore, the cow's visit was in a way a, a personal uh, uh, victory for both of them, you know, bringing, they were able to set the seal by the czar being invited to come over to Britain. Um, he didn't go to London because of security fears, but it was felt that cows was a good place for him to go. Um, so they could combine the social, uh, the regatta and all the fun of the yachting and all that and having a good time with their relatives and so forth, alongside some important political discussions. So must remember that there were important political discussions going on board the yachts, the Imperial Yacht Standard and on board King, uh, the King's Yacht, the Albert Victoria. And foreign secretaries of both countries were there and there were various discussions between them about how to manage to handle Germany, how to handle the new peace between the two countries and so forth. Uh, so all that I cover in my book. So I tried to give the much wider picture of the cow's visit. And of course, the book, I also explore the personal side of the, the Zahl's visit to the Isle of Wight, the two grand duchesses going shopping for the first time in their lives uh, in Cowes, High Street, um, the visits to Osborne and Barton Manor, particularly, you know, which was sort of high point, the visit by the two grand duchesses to Whippingham Church. So all that's covered alongside uh, the, the political uh, dimensions and the important security tensions. I, mean, I don't think Britain had ever seen such a security ring that was thrown around the Tsar and his family during that visit. So that's all evoked in the book as well. So you've got the glamour, the parties, the social season, the yachting set alongside the fears of and the insecurity, the worries about, you know, would the Tsar be assassinated by anarchists on the Isle of Wight if he stepped foot there, plus all the political dimensions. Uh, so it does, yes, the 1909 visit occupies a very important part of my book for those reasons. I mean, what's your view on 
re-establishing what were once these remarkable um, relationships between two great nations. Yes, I mean, it's certainly, I, I have long had a view that, that relations between the British and Russian peoples, um, and I say peoples, not governments, have generally been quite positive over the centuries. Um, there's, you know, you referred earlier to the um, sort of Russia filia that swept Britain uh, before the First World War. Um, and, you know, love of Russian literature, of music, of art, of culture was, was, ref, was replicated in Russia, was re, the Russian love of British uh, culture and art and literature. So that level has always been a lot of understanding between the two countries. I think there's been a lot of misunderstanding at government to government level, a lot of mistrust, um, which has been unfortunate. And I, and I think there has been sometimes on both sides a tendency to fall back on lazy, lazy stereotypes of each other. Uh, these are easy things to fall into, you know, the aggressive Russian bear on one hand, you know, there are many cartoons of that, as we know, in, in the 19th and 20th centuries, you know, with its claws outstretched, about to gobble up a bit of Europe or Asia or whatever, was a standard stereotype of Victorian literature. Um, similarly, inside Russia itself, views about the Britain, the Britain as a perfidious Albion, you know, never to be trusted, Rush, British spies, you know, mirror the sort of British fear of Russian spies and so forth. So these are all, there is truth in all these things, but equally there are stereotypes as well, which I think both countries can fall back on. It would need, I think, you know, because... 1907 to 1917 was a unique, a rather unique period in Anglo-Russian relations when the two countries actively worked together. But it would need um, a major reset, a major determination, I think, on both sides, from both Britain and Russia, uh, governments, from both governments of both countries, to reset the relationship in a positive way, in the way that Tsar Nicholas and King Edward VII tried to do in 1907. That was a deliberate attempt by by the, by the governments of Britain, by the monarchs of those two countries, to kind of overcome the prejudices and stereotypes and say, okay, we we know all that, but let's try and put this on a more positive footing now and move ahead and trust each other a little bit more. And I suppose, you know, the 1909 Cow's visit was that, that was the peak of that. And it's never, never been better since. Um, whether we can get back to that, I think that requires um, quite a determination from both governments to, to set aside some of the prejudices and fears and perhaps trust each other in new ways. I don't doubt that the British and Russian peoples would welcome it at a personal, person-to-person -person level. And certainly talking to many Russians in, in Britain who've read my book and been in touch with me and so forth, they, they all say, why can't we get back to what we had then in cows at that time in 1909? Could we, is there an opportunity to reset the relationship in a new way between the two countries, I think it'll be a marvellous thing. Well, everybody loves a wedding, and um, uh, that possibly might be the starting point for um, re-cementing relationships, because Russians are like us and have perhaps a deep monarchist mentality. Um, we've read recently of a, a very grand, spectacular wedding in St. Petersburg, the first royal wedding since the days of the imperial monarchy of Grand Duke George Romanov. Um, tell us about the existing family and their claims to the monarchy and the way that the Putin regime is kind of courting that monarchy. Um, where does that fit in the current narrative with Russia? Yes, it's very interesting about the Romanovs and contemporary Russia. Um, there's no doubt that there has been a rehabilitation of the Romanovs inside Russia, you know, since the fall of communism. Um, and we know, of, of course, that the, um, uh, the cathedral of, on the spilt blood in Ekaterinburg was built on the site of where the uh, Romanov family were murdered in 1918. And that has become a great centre of pilgrimage for people who uh, support the monarchy or feel that the monarchy still has a role inside Russia. Uh, similarly, many of the Romanov family, different members of the Romanov family, have now uh, connections with Russia, um, and that is celebrated inside Russia. Um, um, and, and so therefore, at a certain level, 
the, the Romanovs have been welcomed back into Russia and there is a, um, a certain rewriting of history going on and a certain ambivalence, I suppose, towards the revolution uh, from the highest political circles in Russia. I think the, the 2018 anniversary of the revolution, 2017 and 2018 anniversaries of the revolution, was a more muted affair than one might have expected. Uh, yes, there were things to celebrate about the revolution, but also a lot of things that went wrong uh, as a result of the revolution. But I don't think personally that there is any great desire in Russia to restore the monarchy. I think they, there's a view that that is a period of history that's now over. Um, there is certainly sympathy for, for what happened to the last Tsar and so forth, and, and a, 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 a sort of interest, media interest in the Romanovs. And I think within that context, that wedding went ahead. Um, you know, it, 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 within the Romanov family itself, there is controversy about Grand Duke George. I mean, he is considered by many to be the legitimate claimant to the Romanov throne if the monarchy was restored. But other members of the Romanov family would contest that um, and claim that uh, there is no settled uh, successor to the last Tsar. Um, so I think the wedding, in a sense, was a great social occasion. And I think the Russians love show. They love they love a, a flamboyant show. We always know that, you know, the, the palaces and the great Russian czarist gatherings were glittering affairs. Um, and I think in that in that sense, that wedding was was in that tradition. Um, I don't think in any way it portends the uh, restoration of the Romanovs or anything like that. I, I, it's interesting that Putin himself you know, didn't specifically send any message of congratulations to the, to the couple. You can generally congratulate it, uh, all Russians who were marrying that day. Uh, but we do know there are some links with the regime in various forms. Um, but I think, you know, they did, have done recent opinion polls inside Russia. You know, the majority of people would not want to see the Romanovs restored to the throne. Um, so I think they will they will continue to play a um, interesting role uh, and social color and and link perhaps um, modern Russia to its heritage. I think that's an important part. Of course, the links with the Orthodox Church, as we know, the last Tsar and his family are now canonized as martyrs uh, and so on. So there's a great sort of link. There's a great traditional link between the Romanovs and the Russian Orthodox Church and Russian history and so forth. And I think that plays an important role in helping Russia move on from what happened in the revolution and so on. Uh, but I think in political terms, I would doubt very much that the monarchy would be restored. And there are a number of Romanov um, societies and groups scattered around the world, and, and uh, including many in the United Kingdom. Um, have they shown interest in your work? And, and one of those societies I know is behind the erection of the Memorial Cross in East Cal. Mm. Tell us about the Romanov societies and the way they viewed your book. Yes, I mean, uh, there are quite a number of Romanov societies of different sorts around, um, many of them linked to uh, the family in some form or other, to all have support from members of the family. Um, the, the particular society that built the, erected the cross um, in East Cows is the Grand Duchess Elizabeth Romanov Society, which is very active, actually, in promoting a better understanding in the UK about the links between the Romanovs and Britain. Um, they publish a, a magazine um, called Romanov History UK. Um, they, um, we've had, as you know, very good uh, links with them, um, and they've been very supportive of the book. Um, they, they did a full page extract from the book in their last publication, their last magazine issue. Um, and of course, they're very active in promoting the role of the Isle of Wight within the context. Um, we don't agree on everything. Of course, they have a, you know, a, I would say a, a, a more monarchist perspective on, on history, on, on the Romanovs, uh, less interested perhaps in the revolutionary aspects of the, of the history of British history with, uh, with Russia. Um, so while my book tends is, is an even handed approach, uh, I feel, to evaluating benefits and good points on both sides and bad points on both sides, um, I, I think they would have more of a perspective that the revolution was a bad thing, um, shouldn't have happened, uh, possibly, and damaged Russia. That's a, that's a particularly legitimate viewpoint. I mean, I know myself from meeting people who, who are, had families that fled Russia, 
uh, that they again are mixed. You know, some families feel very strongly that the revolution shouldn't have happened, that it was a bad move and so forth. Other for exile families like my own possibly take a view um, that perhaps Russia hadn't been run so well in the last, in, in its last imperial years. And the revolution was possibly extreme in its violence and so forth, but had been coming in one form or another to Russia. Uh, and it's a historical fact now, we have to live with it. Um, so I think, yes, some of those Romanov societies are strongly monarchist, and that's their starting point. And it's the support for the dynasty that drives them forward. And naturally, they don't necessarily feel comfortable with exploring the sort of revolutionary history of Russia in, in, in the same way that they would support the monarchist history of Russia. Thank you, Stephen. Well, one other point as we wrap up um, this fascinating session is, is that you've created as a result of the book uh, two walks to celebrate the legacy of the Russian links in both Venda and another walk in Kaos. Tell us a little about that. Uh, we've got two walks, which we set up with Medina Publishing um, on the, and with the um, East Kaos Heritage Centre and the Ventnor Heritage Museum. And the East Kaos walk is, uh, is, is, is literally in the footsteps of the Russian imperial family. Uh, it's um, led by Sarah Lang, formerly curator of uh, Carisbrook Castle. Um, and it's a, a walk that takes uh, people around all the sites in East Cows um, associated with the Romanovs. Um, there, were, there are also sites in, West, in Cows itself, like the Royal Yacht Squadron, which have links to the Romanovs, um, but the walk it would be too long a walk. So we had to focus on areas where there was perhaps principal contact. Uh, the second walk is Ventnor, and it, we've it's titled it rather daringly, uh, Ventnor, the Cradle of the Russian Revolution. Um, and uh, some people might dispute that title, but actually I stand by it, that Ventnor in many ways generated a lot of the radical thinking that led eventually to the Russian Revolution. I mean, in the end, Karl Marx was there writing some of his vol later volumes of Das Kapital and in correspondence um, with Russian radicals, Russian communists. Um, so it's played a very significant role in shaping some of the thinking. So those are the two walks we're running at the moment and both very popular. Um, so sign up early if you want to get onto one of the walks. Uh, we do advertise them quite extensively um, in the local press. As to other events on the mainland, yes, I'm continuing with a, there'll be a lot of, it's still a lot of events in the Isle of Wight coming up. I mean, obviously there's a great deal of interest in the Isle of Wight in the book and so forth, but we've now got events agreed um, in Durham, University of Durham, um, in, in York, um, also in Liverpool, um, also in London, um, and we're hoping to hear back from a number of festivals in, in the mainland UK uh, who've taken the book and are showing interest in it now for next year. But they could be, I could be possibly talking at some of the literary festivals uh, on the mainland. And you mentioned earlier to me that, that there is interest from the Russian cultural attache on an event to celebrate the launch of the book in London. Is that still planned? Well, we've been in discussion with the Russian Cultural House in, in uh, London, in Kensington, about the possibility of doing an event there, um, possibly in collaboration with the University of East Anglia. Um, we've got a number of um, uh, speakers, in fact, uh, Dr. Uh, Professor Peter Waldron, Dr. Peter Waldron, um, who was Professor of Russian History at the University of East Anglia, uh, was one of the uh, early uh, editors or reviewers of my book. Uh, in a sense, and has been very willing in a, in a way to work with me on doing some events around the book on the mainland. Yes, we very much like to do something with, with the Russian Culture House. Um, it depends on their availability, I think. A fascinating and unexpected tale, which provides wider insight into the often tangled story of Anglo-Russian relations. And I think that very much sums up your remarkable work. And, and, and uh, which really does tease out incredible connections and which most people here on the island would not have recognized, including me. So um, thank you for sharing your insights and your thoughts and for writing this book. Well, thank you very much, Peter. And thank you for publishing the book. Um, I think without the support of Medina Publishing, this, uh, as you say, intriguing, remarkable story would not necessarily have been known about or heard about. Thank you. Thank you.
thank you very much for participating in the Isle of Wight Literary Festival. If you've enjoyed this presentation, please consider making a donation. Follow the Donate Now button from the homepage of our website. You can also benefit from great discounts by ordering via Blackwell's Bookshop from our homepage. We'd like to thank the loyal sponsors and supporters who've sustained the Isle of Wight Literary Festival over the past years. Without their financial contribution, it will be difficult to attract the many wonderful speakers we've hosted while keeping ticket prices down. This year, their support has enabled us to provide the digital festival free of charge. Thank you.